thousands of new worlds. Our exoplanet research is scouting for Earth 2.0. Lisa Kaltenegger, Cornell University, Ithaca. Even at the age of 12, I knew that the 9th of November 1989 was one of the special moments in history. When you go out at night and you look at the night sky, then you can see about 6,000 stars out there. Well, if we go out tonight, we probably won't see that because of all the city lights, but we'll see an amazing display of those balloons signifying the wall disappearing here in Berlin, of course. But on a dark night, you see about 6,000 stars, 6,000 other suns in the sky. And that is only a tiny fraction of the stars that exist in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. There are billions of stars in our own galaxy alone. And so here you have a few, an image of how our galaxy should look like, because of course, we don't have a picture of our galaxy yet, because we've never flown a satellite that went so far away that it could look back and see our galaxy as a whole. So what we do is we look around us, and then we look what galaxies exist out there, and therefore we know how we would look like. But I brought this picture up to show you that there are so many stars alone in, uh, in our galaxy alone, billions of stars. And in case you're wondering, it's about 100,000 light years across from one side to the other. And what I'm showing you here you see where you are, this is where the sun is, we're about half out from the center. But this tiny circle around the sun that you see is really where we are currently searching for other worlds. So we haven't even tapped most of this amazing diversity or this amount of stars out there. Except for one part of the sky, so this is about 100 light years, so light needs about 100 years to get there, needs eight minutes to the sun, just as a comparison. And this is about a thousand, well, actually, it's not perfectly scaled, but what this should depict is a thousand light years, because this is where this new mission, the NASA mission Kepler, has scouted 150,000 stars, looked at it for three years, to find out what the fraction of planets around stars really is. How many suns do have a planet out there? And if you go out at night, just put your arm like this, because this is the part of the sky that Kepler looked at. This is where we have 150,000 stars, and this is where we found thousands of planets. And then if you want, try to figure out how many more there must be, because this is the fraction that we looked at of the whole night sky. And I promise we will try to do the whole night sky, but just this information is giving us insight in what kind of planets are out there and what kind of other worlds are fascinating, diverse, and also very different sometimes than we are. When you look out at night, I showed you this beautiful picture of our galaxy. And remember, when it's really, really dark, you see this beautiful stripe of white going through the sky, the Milky Way? That is basically you looking into the plane of our own galaxy. So the stars are so tightly packed that you cannot resolve them anymore. So you only see a band of white because the light's behind the light's behind the light. But if you look out of that plane, you see a couple of really dark patches there. And so you could think, well, there's not much there. But a while ago, we were saying, well, what about if this is like when you have a digital image with your camera and you just don't see something? It could be because there's nothing there, or it could be that the shutter wasn't open long enough for you to see it. And so what they did is they used the Hubble Space Telescope a big telescope in space, 
and basically looked for 200 hours at one of these really dark spots in the night sky. And if you do that, this is what you get. This is, of course, the Hubble deep field image. And what you see is that in this dark part of the sky where you could think there's nothing, you have thousands of other galaxies, and each galaxy has billions of stars. So we have billions of stars in our own galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies out there, and we are searching for other worlds in our own neighborhood. And we are just doing it in our own neighborhood, but we've already found thousands of planets out there. And so now I'm going to have a very good assistance in the audience because I want to show you how we can actually do that. So this is a planet. Oh, I was about to shoot it. Whoops. See, I can't even fit. So this is my trusted assistant, Kalle, and he is a star. And in case there are now some planets coming your way, just grab one. Perfect. This is how you find a planet. That's what we do. <laughs> so what Kalle is going to demonstrate, oops. What Kalle is going to demonstrate here is like if you are a star and the planet goes just by chance between us and the star, you, of course, don't see part of Kalle here. And if Kalle were a star, he would be, he is a star, I'm sorry. But if he were a real astronomo astronomical star, he would be incredibly bright because it's a hot surface that you see. And the planet is really not incredibly bright. So the planet basically blocks part of the hot surface from your view. And now you have to move the planet from one side to the other. Professional, very trusted assistant. I think the PhD in astronomy is coming along very well. And I can just show you in comparison, if he had a bigger planet, thank you, it would block more of the light that Kali is giving out from your view. So what you really see is the star becoming dimmer periodically, depending on how long it takes the planet to go around the star. Thank you very much. And this is what uh, you actually see here, I hope. So there are two methods how we find planets. One is if the planet just by chance goes in front of the star and blocks part of this really, really hot surface from your view. So the star becomes dimmer periodically, as I said. And the other method is, of course, when the planet goes around the star, the gravity of the planet tucks on the star. So the star wobbles back and forth. And that you can see using radial velocity, the Doppler shift. Remember, the car that comes towards you, goes away from you, has a different sound. Same thing works for light. And the star has to make a movement, countering the planet's movement, because if you are rotating and have something heavy in your hand, you also need to lean back to balance it. And this is basically what you see here. And then if you have a look at this animation, this is basically how we find a lot of these planets. This planet, the star is very bright, then it dims, but while it dims, part of the stellar light gets filtered through the atmosphere of the planet. And so all of a sudden, you have the tool in hand to, over light years away, read the atmosphere of another world, figure out if the air is something you would want to breathe, or definitely not. And the other thing that's very exciting about this is, as you saw with my very trusted assistant, if the planet is bigger, of course, it's much easier to find. But if I plot how many planets we have versus how big they are, this is the graph that you get. This is the radius of the planet here on the bottom. This is Jupiter at around 10 Earth radii. And this is the Earth around 1 Earth radii. And what you see is that the number of planets out there increases so much for the small planets.
And this is where it gets exciting, because if you have a Jupiter, that is very exciting, but we probably wouldn't talk too much about whether or not there's life out there. And so there's a lot of small planets out there, and from what we found so far, every second star out there has at least one planet. And I have to say at least, because we can't find the small ones yet. We need the bigger telescope that can collect more light to find the really small, tiny planets. That is Earth and smaller. But we are already starting to find those. And the next step is now to actually collect the light from those planets. And what you see here is actually, until now, the picture of our own Earth taken from the furthest away spot. So if you're wondering, this is us. And Carl Sagan wrote an amazing piece about this. He called this the pale blue dot. This is how I got the inspiration for my institute. And mind, I put an S at the end because it's not just one planet that we're trying to find, one other Earth, but a lot. And so once you have that, this is an image of our own Earth from about five light hours away, so further out than Saturn. And now if you shrink our whole planetary system to the size of a cookie, that hopefully next time you have a cookie, you will always remember astronomy very fondly. When you do that, then the next star is about two cosmic football fields away. So this image that I'm showing you here is within this cookie. But we have the technology in hand. Mind you, we need bigger telescopes for the small planets to read their atmosphere. But right now, we have the technology in hand to take images like that of big planets that orbit suns that are cosmic light years, cosmic football fields away. And so this is, until now, was an image taken with a mission that we started in 1977, Voyager 1, that looked back and had a look how Earth would look like. This is, until now, the furthest away image we have on our own planet. But, of course, if you had a digital camera from the 1977s, you probably wouldn't want to use it anymore because the technology wasn't so up there. So I'll give you another picture from a new mission, or newer mission, Cassini, that launched in 1990. And so now you see the Earth here. And at that point in time, I usually figure out if my students are still awake. Because somebody will say, um, Professor, are you really sure? And so this is, of course, Saturn. But what you see here, this is our own planet. And I like this image a lot because a lot of times people ask, why do we find the big planets? Well, look at the image. Which one is easier to spot? But the exciting thing is, if we now have a planet like that, what you do is you collect the light of this planet with a big telescope, and for the real Earth analogs, we're waiting for the next generation of telescopes. 40 meter, we're building it in Chile, the European extremely large telescope, and for the follow-up of Hubble. Hubble is going to come down, and the James Webb Space Telescope is going to go up, 6.5 meter telescope in space. So, now you have this dot, this pale blue dot, hopefully. What you do is you remember your physics experiments in school. You basically split up the light in its color components and figure out what the intensity is in all of these colors or wavelengths. And if there's something missing, and you see that in the spectra here, that basically tells you exactly, the absorption features tell you exactly what the composition of the atmosphere is in such a planet. And this is Earth. And you see that the fingerprint of life on our planet is oxygen or ozone with water and a reducing gas like methane that's actually hiding here in the wings. But it basically generates a spectral fingerprint, spectral fingerprint of a planet that shows you also signatures of life. And so, in all of this, we're also learning a lot about our own planet because we're understanding, we're starting to understand how our planet actually works. If you have a look at the history of the Earth as a last point, 
is that life started pretty early, and we came on the line. If this is 24 hours, about 30 seconds before midnight. So this spectral fingerprint <coughs> that I was talking to you about. Is actually changing through Earth's history, and it's changing if this planet is bigger or smaller, hotter or colder, and exactly that is what we're doing in the group, what we're modeling in the group that I'm leading, and it's the next walls to fall, finding these other worlds and figuring out if we are unique, if we're different, and how potentially another Earth could look like. Thank you very much.